Lord Jesus Christ. Glory forever. Good morning. Good morning, Father. So again, today, we celebrate a pre-sanctified liturgy, and then this evening will be our final of the bridegroom services. The Holy Gospel today reflects a time when people are getting complacent and also being impatient. The bridegroom comes, and it talks about the virgins and those in the fields and those who are given talents in order to do something with their lives. What do we do with our lives? What do we do with the time that we have? I saw a very interesting post that showed that the time that children spend in church was represented by a jar that was about this tall, about that wide, and it was filled with orange ping pong balls, right? That's the time that children spend their time in church. And then the time that the children spend their time at home away from church was represented by something about that big as well, but about 12 feet tall, filled with the ping pong balls. You can see the stark contrast. And if the parents are not teaching their children, and if the home has not become the little church, the only time that you are getting any kind of spiritual nourishment is once a week, a lot of times. A lot of times, that's it. Which means, in our busy society, in our time now, you actually have to take initiative and work toward becoming holy, becoming righteous, and becoming people of virtue, battling the passions. I know that I have a lot of good portion of my life I spend talking to my spiritual children, either through text or through phone. But I do not spend 24 hours a day with people. And typically the only time my spiritual children call me is when they're struggling the most. Right? The time when they need helping, help getting over that hump. But what happens in our lives? Today, we hear the Old Testament story, right? The Old Testament history of Job. Job was a man who was righteous. Job was so righteous that God looked at the enemy and said, Have you considered my servant Job? Now, I don't know about you, but how many of us would be, have the honor of having God asking our enemy, have you considered my servant, Father Demetri? How many of us? Honestly. Honestly, in a direct self-evaluation, in this direct self-accounting, how many of us would have that? Job, as a matter of fact, loved his family so much that he sacrificed every single day to ask God to forgive his children, to have mercy on his children, to have mercy on the people. And in this particular reading today, we have where we hear that Job loses everything. As one guy is telling him he's lost all his camels, the next guy is on his heels running up saying he's lost something else. And as he's telling him that, the next guy is telling him, I've lost something else. I've lost something else. And then finally, uh, it says that the wind hits the four corners of the house, and it knocks the house down and kills all of his children. Now, I don't know about you, but that would be a hard pill to swallow. That would be hard for any of us. But a lot of times, we can't get past the fact that our spouses are just a little bit grouchy to us. A lot of times we can't get past the fact that we've lost our job, that our tire has gone flat, that we get cancer, that we get this, we get that, we get this, we fall. Whatever it is, you multiply it, Job got it. Because at one point, the enemy goes back and says, well, of course Job's going to glorify you. 
And Job, after he lost everything, he says what? He says, naked I have come into this world, and naked I will go out. Nothing belongs to me anyway. And if we get through that our mind, our spouses aren't ours. Our children, they're on loan to us. As I've said over and over again, we are supposed to be not raising our children, but we are supposed to be serving our children, teaching them how to be servants to the Most High God. And Job understands this. He says, naked I came into this world, and naked I am leaving. And then at one point, he gets boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. I don't know if any of you have ever had a boil. I've had one or two of them in my life. I can't even imagine having my whole body covered with them, even on the bottom of my feet. And Job, no matter what happens, until his buddies come, right? Right? His friends, the people of the world, the peer pressure of the world comes to him and they start saying what? It's got to be you, Job. The only reason any of this is happening to you is because you, 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 Job, you're not holy. You're not righteous. You're not the man you're supposed to be. You are at fault. And Job starts to struggle with it. Because even at one point, his wife is like, why do you still believe in God? Why don't you curse God and die? And Job, he's, he's sitting sackcloth and ashes. He is mourning. And as he's mourning, the world is pressuring him into giving up on God. And at one point, God and him, he starts having a conversation with God. I wait until I see you, Lord. Wait until I get a minute with you, Lord. Wait until I get a chance to ask you all these questions. And God comes. And God asks him, were you there at the foundations of the earth? Were you there when I created the heavens and the earth? Were you there when I, plant, when I planted the trees and created the sun? Were you there? <coughs> you weren't there. And God comes to him and answers those questions by asking his own. I don't know about you, but I wasn't there. I wasn't there at all. For me to question the sovereignty of God, for me to question the holiness of God, for me to question all the things that I go through in my life and question, Whoa, God, why do you let those things happen to me? I should be saying, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father God for allowing me to taste just a little bit of what you went through. Thank you for allowing me to taste just a bit of what you got went through. And then Job, at one point, he says, even though he slay me, I love him still. Those were Job's words. Even though he slay me, even though he destroys me, even though all these things happen to me, I will love him still. Because Job knew. And Job trusted God. Ultimately, he trusted God, but the peer pressure got to him. Because in truth, there is no magical solution to our woes in this world. As I said yesterday, for those of you who have came yesterday, right? When Jesus was crucified on the cross, when Jesus hung on the cross, what happened? Creation groaned. The sun became dark. The earth shook. Creation was angry because the Creator was crucified by its, His creation. And Jesus said, as when he returns, and the time before he comes, that it's going to be the same way, that the sun is going to be darkened. There's going to be earthquakes in various places. There's going to be wars. There's going to be rumors of wars. There's going to be plagues. There's going to be famines. There's going to be all these things happening. Because the world is groaning. <coughs> the world is angry. The world is frustrated because creation knows God better than we do. It knows better than we do. 
How dare we? How dare we look at God and say, you know what? You didn't do it exactly what I wanted you to do. You didn't do it in the time frame that I wanted you to do. You didn't do these things the way I wanted you to do. Therefore, I'm just not going to believe in you. Instead of trusting him. The being that was there that created the sun and the moon. The being that created the bolts of the heavens, that created the waters, that created the trees, created the grass, created the animals. And then, with his very breath, as he went into the garden, as he was breathing, as his very breath, because God's very essence is holy. Even as he breathes in and out, just being in his domain, just being in his vicinity, we become holy. And as he's breathing, that fine dust that you see on the top of your pictures and the fine dust that you see on top of your cabinets, that is the breath that was being mixed with that fine dirt that created man. It wasn't just a big, huge lump of dirt that got thrown on top and his fingers got pushed. No, it was time and it was delicate. Because with creation, he spoke it into existence. Let there be light. And there was light. Let there be the trees and the grass and the firmament and the rivers and the waters and the stars and the sun. And it was done because he spoke those things into creation. But when it came to man, he took time. And he was breathing. And the very fingerprints of God are within our very DNA. Our fingerprints are a representation of his fingerprints. Because we are made in his image. And as, we, as, he, breathed, as he breathed his breath, it gave man life. From the very beginning, he didn't speak man into existence he breathed the man into existence. And all it takes is a little bit of trust. It takes us preparing ourselves with that oil, like the virgins, having the oil prepared with the talents, having us taking our talents and glorifying God, whatever it is that we do. If you're a landscaper, you glorify God by landscaping. If you pump out oil, you do it to the best of your, own, your existence because you glorify God by every action that you take because he put you there and you don't know who it is that you're going to see, who it is you're going to encounter, and who needs to have the breath of life next to them when you encounter them with the light that shines from you. But instead, a lot of times, we just bury our heads this is my job, this is all I'm going to do, this is all I'm going to keep focused on, and this is all I'm going to do because this is what I get paid to do. That You're there because God wanted you there. If you have that job, you're there because God wanted you there, and there will be an opportunity, even if it means that you meet one person that day, and all the course of the, however long that you worked at that job, you might meet one person that you get <coughs> to share the gospel of Christ with the good news. Even if it means that you don't speak anything, but just listen. Who are we to question God? Who are we? And Jesus tells us, he warns us, the readings for yesterday and today are a warning to us. You do not know when I am coming back. Therefore, you must be ready. You must be prepared. You must be ready for me to come back because you do not know the time and the hour. If we are married, we glorify God. We glorify God with our existence. We glorify God with our marriage. And if our marriage is falling apart, we glorify God with our marriage and we glorify God with our existence. And if we have children, we glorify God with our existence. And we glorify God by how we act, how we say, how we speak, how we are with other people. We glorify God because that person was on the mind of Christ when he was crucified that day. Every single one of us was on his mind. Every one of us. And if God put that person in 
our life, whether it is we think that God put them there or not, we need to do everything in our power to glorify God and make sure that we are being the light to those people in our lives. Because if we're not, it's just like the foolish virgins. It's just like those people that have buried their talent. Oh, Lord, look, I knew what kind of man you were. I buried the talent. Here's the talent back. You knew what kind of man I was. You knew what kind of God I was. You knew who I was, and yet you did not listen to me. You knew what I expected. Because he told us. He expects of us holiness. He expects of us righteousness. He expects of us love. He expects that of us. And if we don't think we know that, go back to the Bible. Go back to the gospel. The gospel teaches us what God expects of his creation for us to love him with every fiber of our being and to love our neighbor as ourselves because the person that's next to us is the person that God created and had. He was, he, that person was on God's mind that day when he was crucified. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. This is the heart of the law. This is what we must remember. This is what we must do. This is what we must live out our lives. Every minute of every day. King Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, said, As I'm walking down the road, I am supposed to be talking about the gospel. As I'm walking and driving down the road, obviously he didn't have a vehicle, but he had chariots. As he's driving down the road, he's talking about the gospel. As he's sitting at the dinner table, he's talking about the gospel. As he's sitting with his friends, he's talking about the gospel. Every single and every minute of every day, if we spend our time, we can begin to fill up that little pillar full of the ping pong balls because our children will hear us speaking about God every moment of every day. And that is the only way that we are going to be able to save our children from this world is by us becoming God in our family. Let us glorify and praise the name of the Lord today and worship him. We only have a short few more days that we get to spend to glorify, preparing for the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. <coughs> Why did he die? To save us. To rescue us. To ransom us and to bring us creation back to the Creator so we can again come into the garden to be with Him forever. We ask this in the name. Amen. Amen. Let us depart in peace.